Hello and welcome at another episode of the Techmon Podcast. My guest today is none other than Mr. Kieran Flanagan, the new CMO at Zapier, former SVP of marketing at HubSpot, angel investor, startup advisor, and co-host of the Marketing Against the Grain show. Today we're talking about Calendly and why it acquired Prelude. A key component of Calendly's future growth strategy is expansion into specific verticals. And that's exactly what Kieran and I talk about. We each brought three different ideas to the table and riff on Calendly's growth. I hope you learn a lot from that. And if you like it, please rated five stars wherever you listen to podcasts. Please enjoy my conversation with Kieran Flanagan today about Calendly. Three, two, one. Kieran Flanagan, welcome to the show and thanks for being on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kevin. I'm excited to be on. Oh, and I'm excited too. Today we're talking about Calendly, um, a product that I've been using for many years. Uh, and as always, I first want to set the stage about the company, market, product challenges and so on. So I'm sure most of our listeners here uh, heard about Calendly before. It's a scheduling app that's used by over 10 million people from tech workers to yoga instructors and everything in between. Their vision is to be the go-to platform for work and leisure life planning. The basic functionality for those who, for those five people who don't know Calendly yet, uh, it's as simple as if you want to schedule time with someone, you can just define or predefine slots on your calendar, send them a link, and then they can pick a time that works for them. So it makes scheduling super simple. They also added some functionality for charging for time um, and making scheduling even easier, but we're going to come to that in just a second. The company itself was founded in 2013 by Topi Awatona. Uh, it's profitable today and valued at $3 billion. That's the status quo as of 2020. Um, and it reached its valuation by raising $350 million from investors and Autona's life savings, which I found, which I found pretty impressive. Calendly saw massive growth, especially during the pandemic. They grew 50% incrementally year over year in 2021 to about 85 million in ARR, which is pretty impressive, which means that they're growing faster than companies like Zapier or DocuSign and have reached about 53% of market share in the US. So pretty explosive growth. Um, the appointment scheduling market in general has been valued at about uh, 300 uh, million in 2021 uh, of, of market volume. It's growing at a 13 to 19% compound annual growth rate, uh, so, so fairly well. Uh, and it's predicted to reach 500 to 700 million in 2027. So there's, there's a lot of movement there. The market is growing. And uh, remote work and the pandemic have accelerated their growth. Their direct competitors to Calendly, like Calendar.com, Set More, and Time Trade, and then indirect competitors like uh, Google's new business suite, scheduling features, uh, HubSpot, and Drift. Uh, a couple of the bigger trends, as you might already tell, bigger players are moving into the market. I uh, already mentioned remote work and the pandemic being acceleration of market growth. There is just more vertical growth as well, like doctors using scheduling software to schedule appointments, for example. A bit quick about the challenges. Uh, as I already mentioned, Google's workspace um, product is a direct competitor and offers customers to schedule directly to Google Calendar for $8 a month. Actually, Google Calendar is the second largest calendar app after Outlook, which I wouldn't have guessed. Uh, Outlook is used by over 500 million people. Who knew? Uh, and uh, fun fact on the side, if Google Calendar was a social network, it would be bigger than Twitter or Snapchat. So yeah, a, lo a, lot, of, a lot of volume there. Um, so what that means for Calendly is that they need to win the enterprise market segment and they need to go deeper into verticals like sales, HR, or productivity. The context of this episode is that Calendar, sorry, Calendly acquired Prelude which is an enterprise interview scheduling app for recruiting. Prelude raised $2.4 million and has hundreds of customers, um, and they make it easier to schedule a series of interviews, which they call Journey, with several stakeholders without the typical back and forth. So it's more than just scheduling. It provides information um, to applicants, to the company that's hiring, makes interview preparation really easy, and provides companies with hiring analytics. That kind of sets the stage for today's episode. And as the guest, Kieran, I want to pass it over to you for the first growth idea. So if we step back a little bit and talk about Calendly being a product-led growth business and talk about fundamentals in terms of how you grow a product-led business, you really have to grow self-serve, which is what Calendly did through a horizontal and user-based model. So it means users can actually use product 
buy product. You kind of then layer on product led sales, right? You look at your self serve base and you try to figure out how do I find accounts in there that are more uh, that are that can actually buy my higher tier higher tier packages. And then I actually layer on like true enterprise, which is outbound and targeting companies. And so the kind of magic trick that all PLG companies have to kind of pull off is how do I continue to have breadth across my self serve? So how do I continue to like get mass amount of users to use this thing? And how do I actually go for depth of features and target a specific cohort uh, 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 or group of people who will buy a more in-depth version of my product? Uh, and Calendly have obviously gone into HR and likely sales and these other kind of uh, verticals that they can go into. So I think the first one I started with was really like, how do you continue to grow self serve? I think it's really hard for when you're a kind of mature PLG business, that balance of self-serve and going up market, it's actually really complicated. I've talked to a lot of companies who are trying to pull that off. To grow self-serve, you really need new users for your primary use case, which in Calendly's case is scheduling, right? How do you, can I, is there more juice left in the scheduling market? I don't really think there is, or how can I have new use cases that primary, that I can use my primary use case to accelerate? So how do I create new things that users can buy in a horizontal fashion, and I can use my core use case of scheduling to actually accelerate the growth of those? And so I think Calendly are likely at the point where they need to build more products, horizontal products to keep growing. I don't think there's a lot of people who don't know about Calendly probably are not using Calendly for scheduling or have not chosen a competitor tool. And I think when you think about that, right? Okay, well, how would Calendly potentially build new use cases for users? Well, the calendar is really, if we think, think less about the scheduling and more about the calendar, like the calendar is at the heart of how work gets done, right? And scheduling is one form of how Calendly interact with the calendar. And the mistake people make is when you're trying to build adjacent use cases, if it's a totally new use case and doesn't actually interact with the core use case at all, it's really hard. You're kind of just building a separate product and you have to try to convince users to use that product. So what I kind of went through is, what are some things that Calendly can build that you would actually interact with in the same kind of user journey as setting up the scheduling for the calendar, right? So you're not having that kind of context switch into a whole new thing. And so a couple for Calendly that I think are kind of interesting, when I'm setting up my scheduling, I can request someone to include, or I can actually hit a, hit a toggle and include shared notes, which I think is a pretty self-explanatory one where like me and you could, you could book time with me. I would have an option where it would send you our notes, our shared notes, and we could kind of collaborate in that pre and post meeting and would capture all of those notes for each of ours. So again, I'm not actually having to get outside of my setup, my scheduling, it's actually within that scheduling and I can use the scheduling for distribution. Another one that I think would be really cool is I can request people to include a short video as part of setting up that video to provide context. Like there is just so many meetings that I have no context for. And I don't think written word does a great job of that in that context. So again, I can toggle on add video. And again, I'm using scheduling to accelerate use of this new kind of adjacent feature. And I can actually have people kind of opt in to buy those at a later stage. And then the other one that I think is super interesting, probably like outside of what Calendly would want to do. If you actually look at how Zoom Info has grown their data base or like grown the amount of data that they have access to. Now it's not just this, but they have a freemium version of their product. And if you sign up for the freemium version of the product, which is called their community product, it allows them to scrape your contact list. Now you can argue whether that is good or bad for the world, but that is just one of the ways that they capture data. Calendly probably have a better way of capturing that data. Like on the freemium pl platform, you can use it for free, but only if you're allowed to capture the contact record that's actually scheduling with you and script the LinkedIn data and have a database. You'd have to really squint your eyes for Calendly to like go after Zoom Info, but it is one way they could think about continuing to grow the self serve. But I think coming back to like, what is the learning for listeners here? I think at some point you can, you know, you, you have this use case that is horizontal, which is scheduling. It's applicable to users across industries. And at some point that starts to plateau and you have to think about do i want to continue to grow my self-serve business or can i just sustain my growth by going up market i think in this case if you have to grow calendly need to continue growing the self-serve business they're going to have to build adjacent products and those adjacent products should be should have accelerated growth because they're tied into the core use case which is scheduling what i love about this idea about the points you make is that different verticals come with different growth opportunities and that's why I totally agree. You might want to tie some growth strategies to specific verticals. 
Um, what I'm what I'm thinking about explicitly explicitly is the the medical or or doctor market, right? So obviously there's a there's a strong fit for between scheduling and doctors because they make appointments all the time. However, doctors often already have a website, and there might be there might be a strong fit between providing some sort of like an embedding between Calendly and the doctor's website, or maybe even at some point allow doctors and and you know other players and customers create their own little Calendly website if they don't have one themselves. That could be like a little growth mechanism because there's such a strong desire for doctors to just say, hey, look, you can just block it. You can just book a time, right? And then we'll figure out what you have as opposed to verticals like sales or HR where you don't maybe want to allow anybody to just book an interview or a conversation. You want to pre-vet them first, right? So there are differences in these verticals of, of how, of what growth mechanisms you can already leverage based on how these verticals set up and what the dynamics in them are. Yeah, if I was going into medical uh, for Calendly, actually the thing that is really archaic in that industry, because I spent time with a company I was potentially going to do a seed round in and didn't end up doing it. But what I learned was um, there's this whole ecosystem in the back end uh, around referrals. And so doctors refer you to like specialists and all these different people that they, and then they actually get a fee for actually referring you to those to those people. So there's just like, they have all they all have their own little networks. And it's all done through like really rudimentary ways, like email and spreadsheets and all terrible ways. And so if Calendly could actually help not just book in with your primary care physician, but actually having ways that they could then refer you to a list of uh, people within their network and book time with them, uh, I think that would be really useful for, for people in that industry. Yeah, love that. And shared notes, right? Like as you mentioned, there might even be a way yeah. to transfer information. Could be implications about privacy. I know that this is a very uh, sensitive uh, part of the market. My father is a doctor. Uh, I know from experience that, uh, you know, like, like scheduling, transferring information, coordination, referrals, that is all a huge mess. And I would say the standard is probably even more paper and, and phone instead of email. Email is already pretty advanced. So uh, there's probably tons of opportunity to reduce friction in these markets as, an, as a doorway for growth and, and getting customers on board so I, I love the very vertical specific growth strategy um one that i brought to the table is a land and expense strategy to fuel enterprise growth totally support and agree with your points about going vertical specific i think one way to increase the size of the pie for calendly could also be to go up market which you already said and that is enterprise growth they need to build out an enterprise sales team but the growth tip that i want to bring to the table is that they can first of all um, probably identify users that belong to an organization either based on their email address, which is probably the, the, the easiest way, or if maybe users sign up with a personal email, uh, Calendly could use a tool like Phantom Buster to scrape LinkedIn profiles and see if similar users or groups of users actually belong to the same organization and then have the sales team reach out to that organization and make them a good deal right maybe you know it could be 10 percent off if you buy an enterprise account or extra features like two-factor authentication like security is often something that uh, enterprise companies care about and it's often part of an enterprise offering then from there within the sales uh, land and expand strategy once uh, Calendly has a foot in the door with maybe a small team or an organization then the question is how can they expand from there to other teams or organizations one way could just be to get to to identify internal ambassadors or champions uh, but another one is just to simply highlight the perks of people lose, using calendly across the whole company so one of them could be to just you know make scheduling much much easier between teams and organizations and people um, but then there's also a big advantage in understanding where time gets wasted or lost within an organization. Actually, meetings can can be huge productivity killers as you know somebody who has worked at, at Shopify um, I can, you know, we, we had this, uh, or still have this thing, uh, which is called the chaos monkey. Uh, and the chaos monkey is a program deployed by and developed by, by Toby Lutke, the founder and CEO that will just delete every meeting on the calendar with more than two people. Um, and so there could be a morning where you wake up and you see that, you know, uh, you feel like you're on vacation because your calendar is empty, but in fact, uh, the chaos monkey has been deployed and it's, it's a, it's an attempt to remind people how much time can get wasted and lost in meetings. I think Calendly has a huge advantage by providing analytics and maybe even suggestions uh, for reducing the, the time waste from meetings. It might even help people optimize their day. Uh, one thing that I have you know, gotten a bigger fan of over time is to 
to to optimize for energy rather than time which means i you know like I did an exercise where I look at when do i have the most and least energy and what activities increase or decrease my energy and Calendly can make that super simple. And if you multiply that across a large organization, that can be a huge productivity booster. Yeah, yeah. So I think, um, again, if we come back to the kind of three ways that you grow a product-led business, self-serve, I think what you have to continue to go horizontal in some ways. What you're talking really about is like product-led sales. Like how do I overlay sales on top of my self-serve business and start to use that data to sell into accounts? And they are they are for sure doing that. Uh, I, they actually have vertical sales teams. I think one of the ways to think about Calendly as they move up market is just as like CRM platforms like a HubSpot or a Salesforce or these kind of companies, right? They're, the lifeblood of those platforms is to own the contact record and to build products around the contact record because a contact record is the thing that's sticky. I think Calendly is like, how do I build around the calendar, right? The calendar is my version of the contact record and I can build things around the calendar because that's going to make it much more sticky. And so as they go up market, I think the key for any kind of company as they layer on that product that sales is really how do you move from a PQL model, which is like, how does a user identify themselves through usage within the product to a PQA, which is product qualified account, which is how do I aggregate all of the information that I have within that domain to actually flag that and rotate it to a sales team. And so things that could actually be, th- you know, signals for product qualified accounts as you layer on product that sales and move up market are the velocity of new signups. So if you see an influx of new signups come in through a domain, that could be a signal when you see, aggreg- you know, you aggregate the, the, the usage uh, from that domain, like you have 10 people who sign up and they all have some form of usage and you aggregate that to qualify an account and it, and it uh, kind of uh, goes through the threshold. The hard thing around, actually around layer on product that sales and going up market, I think you kind of mentioned it uh, in terms of it's really hard to identify the buyer sometimes, right? And so the PQ, PQL is like someone who self identifies themselves as the buyer because they raised their hand. And in a PQA environment, product qualified account, you sometimes can actually have a lot of users using the product, but actually not have the buyer using the product. Like a, a really good example of that is when you have to sell your enterprise package to IT, like most of the things that you mentioned, to uh, two-factor authentication and these kind of security things are all things that IT would want within the product when they upgrade to an enterprise package. And so IT may not actually be users of your product, but you still have to kind of sell into um, IT. Every PLG business, at some point, they'll see the self-serve, bus- self-serve business start to slow down and they'll need to layer on product-led sales and use that kind of self-serve business to qualify domains and layer on, and have sales kind of call out to those domains. Is there a company that, in your mind, is best in class when it comes to product-led sales or does it just outstandingly well? Yeah, I don't know because it's actually harder to like know what company is doing really well with product-led sales. It's not as easy in terms of just knowing what company is doing really well with PLG because like it's the inner workings of the company. You kind of have to be in the company. I do know uh, Miro. Uh, like I'm a big fan of Miro and everyone kind of knows Elena. And I think that, you know, most things that Elena touched are, are really good. And Miro, I think are an incredible company, but it's really hard to... T- know the companies that are doing really well with product-led sales other than PLG companies that have moved up market. And Miro actually has straddle one of the few PLG companies that truly straddle both sides of the market. They have some of the Fortune, all of the, like a lot of the Fortune 500 use that company. And then actually they have a ton of like individual users and SMBs. And so for me, where you can see product-led sales work really well is when you've seen a PLG business successfully move up into the kind of up-market enterprise space. For sure. Sure, not up. Cool. Uh, Kieran, idea number two, what do you got? Yeah, so I think I, I'm kind of going through really the journey of building a PLG business. I went self serve. You kind of took the product led sales, which I think is the natural next part of building that PLG business. And the third part of really, we've prob- we're probably at like 100 million in AR, right? Like self serve probably gets us to 50 million. We probably have to layer on sales around 50 million. Now we're up at around 100 million. We're like, oh, okay, like, we really need to figure out how to continue to grow this business. And I think what PLG businesses need to do at this point is how do I be a platform, right? If you are, every feature needs to be a platform or it will get bought by a platform or disrupted by a platform. Really good example of this is for the most part, I think the the AI tools you're seeing today are like cool and you know, get a lot of publicity and people are using them, but they're really features of a platform. And, you know, you saw Canva come out with a freemium version of the text image generator and can just 
kill the entire market because it has a disruption. Grammarly is another good example of a company that I think could have killed the write-in space if they had been a little bit quicker. I don't know if they can do that now because companies like Jasper have a really great done a really good job of branding themselves. But it's really hard for features to not get disrupted by platforms when platforms have distribution. That's why you saw Canly buy Prelude. Um, and I think Prelude is an interesting, like it's an enterprise tool and uh, it's an enterprise tool in the HR space. Definitely hard to acquire. I think it's always better to build. I think it was an interesting decision they made to actually buy that. But I suspect Canonly could look a lot like HubSpot, actually. Coming back to the way I think about Canonly, what HubSpot really did was build hubs, like individual hubs, which we are, which are different products or verticals around the contact record, right? Marketing hub, which is basically a set of marketing features that interact with the contact record, but specifically for marketers. Sales hub, same for sales, customer uh, success hub, the same for customer success, and ops hub, the same for like uh, ops individuals. Calendly is really the calendar, right? So you can actually have a version of their tool that's built for marketers where the calendar is at the heart of that, but it's a set of features built for marketers around the calendar, the same for sales and HR. That's what I where Calendly would need to go post product-led sales is how do they be a true platform? How do they make sure that the product is much stickier and harder to rip out because scheduling is really easy to rip out and commoditize. And uh, so less of idea and more kind of like the third act on building a kind of billion dollar PLG business. That was my very similar to my to my second idea as well. Uh, I think it's all about the platform, and my fear is a little bit that Calendly right now is a bit of a one of all is a bit of a jack of all trades, which we already discussed. and need to go into verticals, um, you know, already said. But the sec- second thing is that they're becoming a or that they're a little bit of a commodity. Um, calendar scheduling, um, you know, it, it, it's it's not a it's not a very defensible type of product that can be developed relatively quickly. We already talked about Google and other players, as you said, one of the ways to make your to, to differentiate your product better are the integrations. Uh, I could see, for example, that in the sales vertical, Calendly integrates with products like Gong, Outreach, or Chorus to provide sales transcript and tie these conversations back to the calendar, basically make the, the calendar the, the true source of progress over time, right? They could even play with something like color coding or so to make it blatantly obvious which deals are coming are coming too close or which deals need more vetting, et cetera, et cetera. And if you can make that public, then whole teams could circle around the calendar to, to move deals forward. On the engineering side, I think it would be critical to integrate with Jira, Monday, or Asana to tie meetings to projects. One common challenges are in, in product development or product management uh, are uh, roadmaps, keep, keeping roadmaps up to date and aligning teams. And I think calendars are the most atomic unit that teams can circle around and that teams can use to measure progress on a product roadmap. And then lastly, with marketing, I think it would be interesting to integrate with products like Dovetail or Qualtrics to tie market research to meetings. So if you have, for example, interviews with uh, research participants or, or focus groups, um, that could all be mapped and organized with a calendar. And then you have that same sense of, of progress as you would have on the engineering side, for example, or on the sales side. So I truly agree that, you know, the, the platform is kind of the next big step. And then the question is, how can you allow developers to build on top of that platform? And how can you tie already established products to your platform to, to multiply the value? Yes, agreed. Sweet. Um, do you have a third idea? Yeah, I, so so this is why I'm going to uh, incorporate this into a segment of half-baked marketing ideas. So I have a podcast, Marketing Against the Green. We do half-baked marketing ideas, which are half-thought-out marketing ideas uh, just to get creative. And I'm going to give you two that I think are kind of cool for Calendly. And again, half-baked. So uh, feel free to poke holes in them. The first one is kind of super interesting, which is, uh, again, if you we went, we went self-serve business, product-led sales platform, right? That's how you kind of build a billion-dollar PLG business. So we're coming right back to self-serve, right? I, I want to actually continue to grow the self-serve business. I don't want to just uh, make my money from going up marketing enterprise. I want to keep growing the number of users who use my product. One of the in- interesting ways that Calendly could think about this is... They could acquire a company like Linktree, right? And let me tell you why that's somewhat interesting is because Linktree have amazing distribution, terrible monetization, right? They have amazing distribution, terrible monetization. And so they get around 45 million visits a month just from social, like not from not from everything else. They get like hundreds of millions a month, but just from social because you have 
all of the people using Calendly or not Calendly, Linktree within their bio. And what Linktree is for your listeners is a way to show basically just your primary links. Like you can find me here, 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 and here. And I think they're going to integrate probably e-com. But one of the things that naturally fits in there is, okay, you can find me here and you can also schedule time with me, right? Have an open calendar to allow people to schedule time with me. And so it's like an interesting way that Calendly could get distribution in a product that already has massive amount of distribution, but is struggling to monetize. Now it could be too horizontal for them, like very horizontal where it's applicable to like everyone uh, for the most part, but anyone who has anything to promote or any links to show off. But again, I think if you want to grow self serve, that's somewhat interesting. The other part of the Harpit marketing idea, which is like a just a like fun idea, is you know one of the things that really happened over COVID is it helped networking be more accessible. So like pre the rem- remote being like the primary, a lot of the ways that we've kind of interacted with each other, you kind of had to be in San Francisco or Boston or all of these kind of core cities to build your network. Whereas now I think we've got used to people. Uh, meeting people online on Zoom and building our network that way. Calendly could run this kind of cool campaign where they do this like global mixer. And the global mixer is basically anyone can put their Calendly link into the global mixer and it, and and they should actually purposely get people in different sectors who are really hard to get access to people. Like you would never expect to have a meeting with this person. And then they should do random mixers, right? And so they should be the way that you actually connect with people within work to meet more people, to network with more people, to share ideas. So you could put in your Calendly link, you could put in the sector that you want to meet people, and you can put in some of the topics that you want to discuss. And then they'll actually do this global mixer where they'll kind of match you up with other people. And so what you're trying to do is market the core use case and really help to brand Calendly as being this global way that you connect to other other humans and interesting humans. I, I think they're actually pretty good. Uh, and, and what I love about it is that um, for especially something like Linktree, it opens the door to the creator economy, which I think Calendly should play some role in. The reason I'm saying that is because a lot of creators have mixed income streams, and some of these income streams are often some, some form of coaching or consulting or advisory. And that's, I think, that's where Calendly just has to dominate and be the number one solution. Uh, so I think the, the idea of, of acquiring Linktree is actually a really good one. Calendly already started... Uh, to use M and A as a as a vehicle for growth, I think they should continue down that path. And I, again, I think co- uh, creator economy uh, makes a ton of sense. The the third one that I brought uh, is built on on the same lines, um, and I think they should acquire the the product or company called Fellow. Fellow is a tool that makes meetings more productive by providing agendas, notes, and templates. Um, some of which you can share with the meeting receiver, right? So you have several people in a meeting and the the problem that the fellow solves is that not everybody's looking at the same document. So this allows you to set an agenda beforehand. They have already raised $30 million. So the question is how much, you know, is, is that the right striking time now before they become even bigger? Uh, as far as I heard, they they grow pretty well. And again, I love the the product. And I think they need to get a strong foothold just in a productivity space in general. Uh, it's it's similar to how Docu- DocuSign backed into the e-signature space um, and then uh, integrated with document management and and you know document analytics and, and document generation, all that kind of stuff. Calendly needs to figure out what can they back into as a next as, as a natural step, and I think productivity is the the next logical one. I also think that there's something to be said about task management that Calendly should Calendly should participate in. Um, I personally started to map all my tasks on my calendar because I'm a I'm a chronic overcommitter and that helps holds me accountable. Do you do the same thing? You're you're nodding. Are you doing the same yeah. thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All everything is in my in calendar. Yep, yep. Same here. So I think I think that's a this a huge opportunity for for Calendly as well. Uh, and M and A is probably one way to not having to reinvent the wheel, but you know acquire a company that's growing but early on and uh, and get a strong foothold in productivity. Yeah, I think their biggest challenge is like, you can see it even on some of our notes is they could do a bunch of things, right? Because they're a horizontal product, but you can, you have to figure out like where your sweet spot is. And I think on the acquisition, like you have to have a real clear philosophy on when you buy and when you build. Acquisitions are super tricky. Like you're, you're, you, you build on, you're there building, building different tech stack. The integration is really hard. Like all that stuff is really hard. And so I think there has to be a really good reason to buy over build. The thing for Calendly is like where, where are the verticals that are going to be best verticals to build that art market motion? Because they could, they could go in so many directions. Do you think that the 
recession could be a good opportunity to lean stronger into merchant acquisition. We know that the com that Calendly is uh, profitable and they have decent funding and that during recessions, I mean, right now companies are, are dropping in multiples left and right. Do you think that could be an opportunity to lean even harder into M&A or do you think Calendly should rather extend its runway and see what they can do with, you know, like the, the sales driven motion? From spending a bunch of time on these kind on m a type things i think it's way trickier to buy than people likely think even i had used to likely think like it's um for the most part it's always a good idea to try to build and then you have a philosophy when you buy like it could be something where it's tangential to the core use like you, you don't build your core, any anything that buys that overlaps with your core product we don't we build that anything that's tangential that can get us into a, a, a foothold into a new sector which is really the prelude like gets us a foothold into hr we would buy that so i think on the fellow that seems like something they should build because it's like fundamental part of it touches the calendar right anything that touches the calendar you build anything then you can kind of uh, get a foothold in the market to like use that use case on you can maybe buy do i think there will be more m a i i suspect there would be but it does take it depends how many of those companies have runway to get through the recession because they're they would have to take a sizable markdown and most of these companies are vc backed and vcs are not going to take a large markdown and so i think there may be less m a than we think going back to the last like was it the financial crisis where linkedin got bought um by microsoft like we saw some real traction in the m a market so i suspect there will be uh some interesting deals that do get done maybe as a last question if you were head of growth at calendly how would you prioritize these ideas or which idea would you prioritize at the top and why that is a, so that's a great that's a great question um i think it's where will i get the most stickiness from my use case like some of the things they could do like productivity and project like project management it's like how do i get things that are truly integrated with my core use case which is the calendar again if i think of the calendar as a contact record like how can i build around that contact record and make sure that i'm building for a specific uh vertical that will be much much stickier because they use that in a much deeper way uh where it's not just like surface level so i think sales is a really good example of where that automation of scheduling as like fundamental part of the business like the calendar all of that is a fundamental part of the business and i think you can make that use case very very sticky so i think it's some like a combination of like how much money can i make and how how sticky do i think that use case is and then how competitive is that market like how much can i actually do i do i think i can get traction in there but it's a good question i don't know if i have a good mental model in terms of how to pick the verticals but i think it's a combination of those those things Love it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. I think one often underrated point or argument that you made in expanding into verticals is just how fast can you get traction? Because every minute and every day and every month is costly, um, especially in a in a recession where you know the, probably county might be somewhat affected by that as well. It's often more helpful to to prioritize traction rather than size sometimes um, when kind of when when the uh the water level is dropping across the board simply because you're more agile more flexible you keep cash flow running uh and you don't spend too much time in the cave to come up with a product or an acquisition that takes a long time and then you know who knows what what happens to to, to deals or, or teams eventually that then get cut so i think prioritizing speed over accuracy during recessions is, is one principle that, that that i've seen work really well um and i think there's an application here to county as well Kieran, as, we, as we're coming to an end, do you think there's anything left unsaid here that we should really voice, discuss, any, any question that we should send to Calendly or any, any, any angle that we haven't looked at yet? No, I think we've covered like the, like we, we really covered the, the journey of self-serve, product-led sales platform, had some really good half-baked marketing ideas. And then I think, how do you use the recession in a smart way, like to come out of that much better? And I think for all SaaS businesses, that's managing your churn. Calendly's big thing is, if you really want to be a large business, you have to be multi-product. And so you have to be able to up, you have to be able to cross sell and upgrade because it's the only way to actually get positive churn. Their move into prelude, prelude is probably a start of that, but they're definitely going to have to be cautious about the build versus buy because buying your way there, even though companies have done that, uh, and there's a good examples of companies who have done a good job of that. It is like, it's not, it, it is not 
uh, it is it is hard. It is complex. Totally agrees with that. Plus one. Uh, Kieran, thanks for coming on and riffing and presenting your ideas. I had a lot of fun with this. Uh, I think there's some really good ones. I hope Tope and team uh, hear this and, and it's useful to, uh, to them. But I want to thank you very much for your time. Um, before I let you go, uh, Kieran, where can people find and follow you? Yeah, I think if you're uh, in the mood for another podcast, you can check out Marketing Against the Grain. It's on the HubSpot Podcast Network and then at Search Brad on Twitter. Perfect. Yep. Check out Marketing Against the Grain. And of course, this interview or this conversation was scheduled with Calendly. So uh, thanks for a great product. And I want to thank you all for tuning in and I'll hear you next time. 